Good morning and welcome to the Dr. Deborah Show. This is a show where we talk about bringing peace and calm into your life. And later in the show, we're going to be talking about mental health stigma. Live at KCSB FM, Santa Barbara 91.9. KCSB is a platform for cultural expression and thoughtful discussion, providing a diverse educational forum. I'm a Santa Barbara-based clinical psychologist, and I specialize in pediatric neuropsychology. I've seen thousands of people, and my experiences are vast, and I want to share this information with you. Um, I'm a UCSB alumni, and I also live locally in Santa Barbara. So this show is all about our community and how to create compassionate conversations about our well-being and health. Today on the show, we're talking about mental health and well-being with a focus on music. And we have a very special guest, Peter Melnick. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you. And uh, Peter has a passion for musical theater with a long history working in the music and movie industry. He has a unique perspective as a composer, and his music has been heard around the world on Broadway for movies and TV series. He was Drama Desk nominated for his score for Adrift in Macau. Melnick is the product of an extraordinary entertainment family. His father is film producer Daniel Melnick, and his grandfather was legendary theater composer Richard Rogers. His mom is also, right, your mother? It's Linda. Linda. Linda Rogers is also an accomplished um, person that's been involved in writing and music. And so welcome to the show again, Peter. And um, why are we talking about this today? We're talking about mental health stigma today because in recent news, did you know that mental health is the largest public health priority and the largest financial burden of any health issue in the world. That's according to the World Health Organization, World Economic Forum. The Centers for Disease Control report uh, called Attitudes Toward Mental Illness found that stigma and embarrassment are two of the top reasons why people with mental health issues or mental illness do not seek help or medication. And so issues surrounding mental health affect people from all walks of life. I always like to clarify what is mental health I think of it as like a physiological balance. So your nervous system and your heart and your brain, everything feels kind of calm, your thoughts, and it gives you a sense of inner peace. I did look up a little bit about neuroscience and music and the neuroscience of music and how music affects our mental and physical health. Um, And we've been finding really compelling evidence that musical interventions can play a huge healthcare role in different settings, ranging from operating rooms to family clinics and obviously even our own homes. Uh, But even more importantly, we have been able to document the neurochemical mechanisms by which music has an effect. And there's four domains they found. There's management of mood, stress, immunity, and as an aid to social bonding. That was in a study that was released recently from Stanford. Peter, I was wondering, why do you think mental health is essential to well-being? Uh. That's such a broad question. It's almost hard to know where to begin. Um, We all swim in a a, a soup of 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 health, of of emotion, of thought, and uh, where when our thoughts are distorted, when when we're not able to feel comfortable in our own skin, it's tough to to live. Right, and I'm sure music has definitely helped you. So you're kind of saying that. You know, you can't live within yourself. And I do think that's true because I think you could be around thousands of people and still feel actually very lonely because you kind of have to learn how to tolerate your own voices and feelings in your body. Um, so here's what's coming up next. I'm going to talk a little bit about mental health stigma, and then we're going to talk about mental health and music, and then we're going to talk about prevention and awareness through music. So we're here, like I mentioned, exploring the relationship between mental health and music. I like to just talk briefly about what is mental health stigma because I think a lot of people don't realize um, some of those pieces. And I've broken it down into social stigma and self-stigma. So social stigma is attitudes and discriminating behavior that are directed toward individuals with mental health problems as a result of a label they may have been given. And then self-stigma, which I find to be actually more common in my practice, is the internalizing by the mental health sufferer of their perceptions of discrimination. So they actually take on those ideas, which may or may not be accurate, actually. And I think that stigma can significantly affect feelings of shame and also lead to poor treatment outcomes. 
Studies have suggested that stigmatizing attitudes towards people with mental health problems are widespread and commonly held. So we need to take care of our mental health by being able to discuss our emotions, thoughts, and feelings within ourselves. I'm actually going to play um, a really beautiful piece uh, of music by Peter. Let's see here. And it is titled Still Here. And let's see. Still Here. And then we have The Chill. And I was just thinking which one would be more appropriate considering we have this. Which one do you think, Peter, is more appropriate for this morning with our... Well, I, I I guess you're talking about two songs that I, I wrote um, very much out of out of a need to to address very powerful emotion. Uh, still here is perhaps a good one to begin with because it's it's really it was an attempt to say something this past fall as we're approaching the winter. Mm -hmm. You know, Game of Thrones. Winter is coming. Winter, if you live in Montecito, is definitely coming. Yes. And everybody who lives where I do which is very close to one of the lanes of, of disaster from the, the debris flow event, mm -hmm. we all felt it, even those of us who were lucky enough to walk away without personal damage and, and loss of, of people we were close to, but we all feel it. So this was an attempt to, to express very, very powerful emotions um, that, were about, that came out of that. And I guess because of what's just happened today in the news with, with the most recent mass shooting in... Uh, Thousand Oaks. Uh, yeah. th there's something. This was an act of God, a, a, a natural event. There, there was no person firing guns, but there is a sense of of we all belong to a community. Yeah. So I, I'm very happy to have you play that. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that, and I also just think that I mean maybe while you listen to the song, maybe you'll be able to relate, like Peter's saying, and also find some solace or some peace. And relating, sometimes we don't have words for things, but I think music can really help us move through different transitions. So here's uh, Peter Melnick's Still Here.
thank God, thank God I'm still here. Sunsets and blessings and even laughter. I swear it's been a long, difficult year. A journey through darkness, heartache and fear. But I don't feel defeated. Thank God, I'm still here. Welcome back to the Dr. Deborah Show. That was a beautiful song by Peter Melnick called Still Here that he wrote um, after the mudslides and the fires last year. He wrote this heartfelt song. So I hope you enjoyed that. We're live at KCSB FM Santa Barbara 91.9. This is the Dr. Deborah Show. Where we talk about bringing peace and calm into your life. I'm a clinical psychologist with a specialty in neuropsychology. I'm also a UCSB alumni and live locally in Santa Barbara. This is the show where we're talking all about our community and how to create compassionate conversations about our well-being and health. We have so many wonderful people in our community, and I'm just hoping we can kind of all work together to collaborate and, and figure out how to be kinder to each other and support each other and learn from each other. And we're here talking about mental health and music, and I'm very excited to again announce our special guest, Peter Melnick. Peter, welcome again. Thank you. Peter is a composer, a songwriter, and an author. And he's contributed songs and scores to over 30 films, television shows, and documentaries. He grew up in New York City and is the product of an extraordinary father, Daniel Melnick, known for his work in Footloose, Altered States, and the seminal television comedy Get Smart. And his grandfather was legendary theater composer Richard Rogers. And I also want to honor his mother, Linda Rogers. So he has a very long line of people that he's learned from uh, about music and being exposed and living in that world. And so I feel like he's a great person to have here. Peter, I was wondering, how do you think, I know you briefly just kind of explained some of this too, but how do you think that mental health and music intersect? Well, it's hard. For, I, I could try and speak abstractly, but that's more the acad acad academician's job. For me personally, yeah. um, I think I would be a crazy person if I couldn't make music. I mean, mm. the, 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 the truth is every time I sit down and pick up an instrument or play the piano, I am, I am finding my way. I'm releasing powerful emotion. Uh, when I'm trying to write, when, I'm, when I'm, I'm in the middle of a composing project, I deprive myself of the great joy I have in taking my dog for a walk and singing the songs I love, the songs that have, have given meaning for me to living mm -hmm. by whoever it is, uh, Joni Mitchell, Paul Simon, uh, whoever. Uh, I love doing that, but when I'm writing, I don't let myself do it because it's letting some of the air out of the balloon. And, and that's because I think all music, at least all music I write, is about expressing emotion, even even when it's a film score and I'm under a fierce deadline and it's telling a story that has nothing to do with me personally. Right. I'm still sitting down and if the music's going to be any good, it's because I've found a way to connect my own emotional experience to the story I'm trying to tell mm -hmm. so that what comes out is not just a bunch of notes that work together, but rather notes that have some emotional story. Yeah. Push behind them. I remember when I, I did my PhD at Pacifica Graduate Institute, so I have a clinical psychology PhD, but I also have a depth psychology degree. And one of the things we would do is we, we, we learned how to sink into a dream state, 
And the professor would put on a piece of music, and many times it didn't have any words. And then we had to listen to the piece of music and then write about, like, a story, just whatever came to us, and and then turn it in, and then a month would go by, and then he would kind of have people read their versions. And most of the time, they really matched. Like, there was one on Beethoven where... Mm-hmm. I pictured this person in this cobblestone town with these puffy sleeves going to mm-hmm. get bread at 5 o'clock. I felt like I sunk into his story, so I can see what you're saying, that the music really does tell a story. When you watch a movie or you watch a show, um, the music, actually, I've been really noticing, really moves you into a different place. Like, if you turn oh, the yeah. volume down, it's it's much more emotionless. So I think, you know, music really moves us into places, and it can be very healing. Like you're saying, that you find this space and place where you can let go, and you kind of have learned your rhythm. Like mm-hmm. you said, and also it gives you peace of mind and, and balance, probably, mm-hmm. I'm sure. They actually have some beautiful studies, too, about music, but they're not quite sure what parts of the brain get activated, because so many parts of the brain get activated when they do brain studies. You know, when I, when I was in music school in Boston at Berklee College of Music, um, there's a lot of great jazz players who lived in Boston, and I lived around the corner from a club called Riles, and this amazing guitarist who was in Santa Barbara recently, Pat Metheny, um, came in to, to to sit down his brother's session, and I came up to him at a, at a, a break and, and said, would you ever be open to to working with a, a student composer? Mm-hmm. And what he said was, you know, I spent 10 years trying to learn stuff, and now I'm trying very hard to unlearn it so I can just mm-hmm. play. Just to be freer. And and so what, what I'm really saying is the questions you're asking are not the ones that as a composer I deal with. Right. I deal with, uh, I don't have to think about what part of the brain am I going to affect if I, if I write this note. I, I try and think, what, what, what am I trying to convey musically? And if, mm-hmm. if, I, may, if I reach you, I can tell because... Touches your heart. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, yeah, kind of touches something deep within us that it's the vibration of the music it's the sound and as i mean i am a neuroscientist so i'm kind of adding my little two cents and just as a doctor i just kind of see it in the people i i treat but also and in my own life and i think that that's why i wanted you to come on because there's just so many intersections but for you i hear what you're saying is that it's much more of a focus very professional well it's I mean, I, intellectually, I'm interested in, in neuroscience. I, th- I think it's it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and I know that over the years, there's been a great deal of work. But um, that's not my expertise. Right. And, well, kind of it is, in a way. <laughs> well, yeah. It's just you don't understand the, the, the mechanisms. But I think that you actually intuitively do. And I, I was going to read something um, because there's a, the Stanford neuroscientist that I just was talking about earlier, Leviton who talks a lot about music and, you know, how it's healthy for us. And it really confirmed my intuition um, that many people have about how music, you know, can function in their lives. I mean, we're already in a place and time where people are using music really as medicine. Um, Did you know that the average person hears five hours of music a day? And many people instinctively reach for a certain kind of music to suit certain occasions. So if you're having a party, you play one kind of music. If you're relaxing after a long day at the office, you play another kind of music. So the kind of music you play is programming that's to suit a desired mood outcome in a way. Of course. And so in a sense, you're using mood kind of to regulate yourself. Um, So I think that, you know, it does does tie into our health. Um, I was just going to talk briefly again about mental health stigma. Um, And then we're going to learn a little more, too, from Peter about mental health, well-being, and music. I just like to insert little ideas so that you can kind of keep the idea about mental health and mental health stigma that from the time we're children, we do notice the differences in others. And then we're taught to look at the world from the lens of our upbringing and our life experiences that shape us. Um, And one way we're different is how we're wired, like a thermostat that regulates our temperature. So some of us can, you know, let things go more easily and others might struggle throughout their lives. But these changes occur in our brain, our nervous system, and our thoughts. So I just, you know, I'm always trying to understand why have we chosen to overlook the importance of our mental health? And even with music, really, if you go back to Greco-Roman times, actually the musicians and the artists and the poets, those were the people who everybody really revered. And I know people do revere you, but those were the people who thought, well. My dog reveres me. Oh, I revere you too. (laughs) (laughs) I was just thinking how, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get back to the idea of honoring that you know and saying okay music really is powerful let's really pay more attention to this and do something more thoughtful to have this in our home and in our life peter um 
do you think, you know, if we were able to reduce mental health stigma, I mean, why do you think that's essential? And how could we maybe do that through through the music industry? Well, why it's essential is, is that we all, first of all, there's a difference between the, the, the discussion of uh, mental health in terms of the things that that can that we all live with pains things that just trauma that distorts our own lives for people who are functioning basically um who are functional as opposed to somebody who you know uh, what happened today in thousand oaks smackwater jack to get to make into a, a carol king song uh somebody who who loses loses it and uh and in some fashion acts in ways that that, that society cannot tolerate killing people is pretty big on that list so that cl clearly there's a there's a there's a i don't need to explain why we can't live with a society in which it's fine to to do things because that you're saying it's like right here in our yeah it's right but, here in our yeah but i think what's 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 more interesting because it affects all of us is the notion of the we all live with this concept out there of normal right and i don't think anybody more than one percent of the time comports with their own sense of, 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 of normal. And actually, I love that you brought that up because a couple shows ago I was talking about this, and, and I just think it's such an important idea. So I'm kind of interjecting a little bit. I didn't sure. interrupt you. but not at all. I mean, when I did all my training, normal really is not related to human, I mean, functioning. It's more of a statistical bell curve. So if you take a, a you plot out some points on a line and you make a curve, that the middle range is what we consider normal, but it's usually more related to a mathematical equation. So that's why, I mean, I think what we all want is balance or health, right? I think health would be a, a better way because I don't even know what normal really, I mean, I kind of have an idea of what, you know, normal is, I could guess. But I think more importantly, the words we use, just like the music mm -hmm. we play and the, the things we fill our mind and souls with, um, does impact us. And so, um, I think that, you know, if we can move away from the word normal, and I love that, like the Dalai Lama, he says, we're all breathing in the same air. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we're all here really together. <clears throat> so, so if, if we all understood normal the way you said it, it's a, rep, it's a, it's a, it's a concept. It's, it's a construct that's out there. That'd be terrific because then we wouldn't constantly be thinking, gee, what I just, was, was that a normal thought? Was that a normal feeling? Right. Comparing is, that. Is my sexuality normal? Is my, <laughs> is my taste in clothes normal? Is, so we get oppressed by, by normal <laughs> Precisely because we think it's what we're meant to be, but we're not. Right, and then we then we become the inner critic, and then we start criticizing ourselves because there's a standard that's not even really something we can achieve. So mm -hmm. then we're like trying to reach for something. So I mean, I think if you can move toward the idea of balance and health, and thinking how your two kind of worlds can, as they intersect, all your outside world, your people, places, sounds, smells, all those inputs with your internal world of your nervous system, your brain, your heart, your thoughts, your psyche, your soul, and how mm -hmm. can those two worlds meet in a more balanced way? And then I think we can find this kind of sense of, of health because our heart's beating peacefully, our brain feels a little more peaceful, and, and just to know that we're not going to be like a flat line of that. You know, we go mm -hmm. up and down like waves in the ocean. So how do we meet the waves? And I, I do think mm -hmm. music, like I know I listen to music all the time, and it is true as I was doing the research for this show, I was realizing I do pick music according to my mood, and it, it could depend on the time of day. It could depend on my mood. Do you think the music industry, ta like, is aware of? I mean, I know you said Smackwater Jack from Carol King. I guess that's yeah. what you were relating to the shooting. Yeah. Do you so? Do you think the music industry kind of talks about mental health in a in more of a roundabout way by doing well, songs like that? Well, you know, first of all, I was in. I was really alluding to a lyric. Okay. Uh, I mean, m musically, it's it's just a cool Carol King riff. Okay. Smack water, Jack got a shotgun. <laughs> I'm gonna have to listen to that you know, when I go home. <laughs> it's 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 a, it's a it's an old rhythm and blues Carol King Jerry Goffin. It's cool. Um, so when for for me the conversation is actually a little different if we're talking about music and words. Mm -hmm. Most of my life, I I find when a song pops into my head, I usually think. Why did that song pop in my head? It'll be a lyric I knew from 30 years ago. And why am I suddenly thinking right. that? And I find that there's a connection because, you know, our minds are so incredibly complex. And for me, 
I can't remember where I put my car keys, but I remember every damn lyric that Bob Dylan wrote from, you know. So lyrics are, are, are a telling part, and when I'm, when I'm writing a song, I'm, I'm dealing with the storytelling of a lyric. When you're talking about just the musical component, you're talking about something that is more pure and less specific. And I think in terms of the connection to mental health of somebody who does music, whether as a player or a composer, the most important thing is, is emotional fluidity. That the older I get, the more easily I'm able to cry, the more easily I find myself crying, because uh, there's less of a barrier between my perceptions and my feelings. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the musical component. When it's lyrics, it's about finding, finding words. You're, you're nailing down thoughts. You're getting more specific. Do you, do you usually, it sounds like you usually do those ideas and thoughts kind of more on your own. So you write on your own more, like in a quiet place. Well, or... it's different. When, when, I'm, when, I'm doing, when I'm working in musical theater, it's, it's, first of all, it's all storytelling. If I'm, doing film, if I'm working in a film score, I'm helping a director tell his story or her story. So you're collaborating with them. Yeah, but I'm, I'm collaborating in service of somebody else's tale, harnessing my instincts to help tell that story, which I love. Right. If it's musical theater, usually it's a story that I've chosen to tell. I love, this, I love the two musicals I'm working on now because I, I love the stories, the, the heart that they have. I don't write my own lyrics for those. I work with somebody who is much better at writing that kind of lyric than I am. So you, you have lots of different people you interface with. Right. Does, does anybody ever talk about, like, their own mental health, like, while you're in those meetings, or, like, their own emotional feeling about the song? Like, oh, wow, that is going on in my life, and I can relate to that piece because... Sure. So they, um, you identify it that way. Well, um, we talk about it sometimes, um, but sometimes, for example, uh, there's a song called uh, Finn McCool in, in a musical I'm working on uh, called Snow in August. And the song is a mother's lullaby to her son, trying to help her son go to sleep after he's seen a deeply traumatic event, an anti-Semitic attack in which somebody was brutally beaten, and this boy who's only 11 didn't stop it. And he's doubly traumatized because he's seen the violence, and he didn't fulfill his vision of himself as a superhero who's going to stand up and fight evil. And he comes home, and his mother knows how shaken he is. And she sings this song about Finn McCool invoking his father who's, who's died as well it, that's whose son sees when he pictures this irish legendary hero and there's a line in the song about about finn mccool when she sings and when he died the grief ran deep mm -hmm. and when mindy dickstein my wonderful lyricist co collaborator sent me that lyric and i was working on those lines it was right after a very dear friend had lost a child mm. and the child was with somebody who i i'd known all all his life yeah and that that loss was in the notes of that song. I, Nobody I will get it but, you're but me. About, yeah. yeah, I think about uh, different. You know, we think about different people. So it's also a way to keep their memory alive and honor them. Um, and I was thinking when you were talking earlier. I don't know if you're familiar with Candace Pert. She did the mm -hmm. movie What the Bleep with some uh -huh. other scientists a long time ago. But mm -hmm. um, I almost did research with her. She's not unfortunately. She passed away. But she actually found a place in ourselves where we carry our memories. So, mm -hmm. like you were saying, all of a sudden in a song, it'll come to you, you know, something about your father. Mm -hmm. um, and I do believe, you know, somatic psychology is kind of all about our body and, and that uh, how we manifest that in a psychological way. And I think that I'm sure you have pockets of, you know, memories that, that somehow are bubbling up, you know, as you move into the space with the music. Um, so... Just back to mental health stigma, I, I'm just hoping to keep talking about that. Like I said, um, I think mental health stigma is a mark of shame, and it's one of the greatest opt obstacles for an individual to overcome. I think, though, through prevention and scientifically proven treatment methods, we could radically reduce suffering and the global financial burden we spend. And those labels stem from misinformation, isolation, and negative attitudes. From a lack of understanding about a behavior is like an appearance or communication that get, then gets labeled as not normal, like we were just talking about, um, this leads to further rejection and an increase in mental health conditions. It's also been linked to the worsening of health. So just remember your health, your physical health is intertwined with your mental health. So um, it's not really separate. And I think physics will probably figure that out in the next 10 years. But we really do need to take care of our well-being by being able to discuss our emotions, thoughts, and feelings within ourselves. 
And I think we can have stigma regardless of whether we have a mental health issue or we know someone with a mental health problem. We have a family member with a mental health problem, or we even have a good knowledge and experience of mental health problems. And that's why it's so important to check in with yourself just periodically and not, you know, not all the time and just see what, where you stand. What's your idea about mental health and how do you relate with people who have mental health issues, including yourself? Because we all have mental health issues going on. It's just a matter of whether they overtake our days, right? We want to try to manage our days so we can have some peace. Deborah, when you talk about mental health issues, are you talking about, are you making a distinction between the person who, for example, may present paranoid ideation versus the discomfort I feel on a morning when I woke up feeling some guilt about something that was undone that... I mean, is this all mental health, or are you talking right. about aberrational well, in a different way? Well, I think of mental health as encompassing all of those, and I'm really trying to also move away from the word mental illness because I feel like it really has been stigmatizing. But I think that, um, I mean, if someone ha wakes up like you do and you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. you don't feel quite, your, you know, yourself or you know you need to do something to take care of yourself, that's actually very healthy. So that's really positive. Mm -hmm. Um because, I mean, we are going to go up and down and all around like the waves in the ocean. I think, you know, when someone has um, something more severe like bipolar or schizophrenia, those are really true biologically changed pieces. Like people mm -hmm. who have schizophrenia um, have, have smaller ventricles in their brain. Bipolar people have a 75% genetic transmission rate. And, and, they, and those people do really need usually medication. Even, you know, some people actually somehow overcome schizophrenia and bipolar possibly, but bipolar has a very strong genetic component. So obviously it's a little different because mm -hmm. people, I mean, if you have bipolar, you can't make it through your day like you can, where you can go write music or check in with yourself and notice you're feeling a little down. And, you know, I always tell people really depression and anxiety are really a given. Um, I mean, when everything's changing and we're in flux and we don't know what's going to happen in 30 seconds from now, right? And our friends are changing, our enemies are changing, we don't know we're going to get ill. It, it makes us feel, have anxiety. But I mean, I think we can do things to, or we, and then, you know, we kind of toggle back and forth. If we feel anxious about something, then we end up feeling maybe depressed because we feel anxious, you know? And so I love to textualize that, like make it more juicy and think of like what it is. So, you know, do you feel like a cloud's falling around all day? Do you feel like you want to eat mashed potatoes? Do you feel like you want to be in your pajamas? And and just to check in with yourself and honor that. Um, but I, I do think of mental health. I think that's what you were asking is like how I'm defining mental health, right? Is that what was so just, just to understand, because it, it's such a broad word. When it, when it comes to the walking around mal-ease, malaise that we all experienced at different right. I've I've come to see the world more and more in terms of the relationship between trauma th th things that happened to us way back when that have profoundly affected us that operate on us that that make us feel uncomfortable and 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 not good about ourselves that we can deal with we can look at we can recognize the potency of, of a particular part of our childhood for example mm -hmm. and release ourselves from that Right, and that's that's an emotional process which has become you know I get the difference between me when I was a film composer primarily and now when I'm writing my own songs and picking shows to write now I'm cho I'm telling the stories I want to tell mm -hmm. and the stories very often have to do with 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 that well that makes kind of sense though because I mean I did all my research on intuition which is not a, a metaphysical term it's actually a neurological function and when we have intuition it's actually like the pinnacle of health because everything kind of coincides. And it does occur in our brain neurologically, but also in our body, our thoughts, our, you know, how we regulate ourselves. So I think that, um, yeah, I think that mental health has, it's, it's got a lot of complexity. I just try to use the word mental health, though, as like an overarching idea, mm -hmm. because I just feel like, you know, I mean, yeah, somebody has a diagnosis of bipolar or depression, um, then... They, that doesn't define them, though, right? We're so much more than that. Sure, but you're you're also, as you said, you're talking about biochemical. Right. I mean, what what I was articulating were experiential things. What you're when you talk about bipolar, you're talking about biochemical. Well, and I was issues. thinking how you were talking about trauma too. Um, I was just mulling that mm. over, and I think that the more we can face those traumas and um, integrate them into who we are, like you're doing, that's mm -hmm. really kind of a sign. I think that we're becoming more healthy in a way because we're having more self-acceptance. 
So we're moving away from that inner critic. And then also we're kind of having healing and resolving because we can move through that. And, and you know, the music is great because you can listen to it again and again and keep moving through it that way. There, there's a, uh, I just thought of somebody who so illustrates all this and brings it together. There's a wonderful now, now dead songwriter named Dory Previn, who was a friend of mine from childhood. Uh, and I first became aware of her work when she had, she'd already won an Oscar for the lyrics to the, the title song from the Valley of the Dolls, which was a wonderful expression of people coming back from drug addiction. It was a series of incomplete sentences. I've got mm. to get, how do I get back where I, mm. she could never quite finish the sentence, which was perfect for the mental state she was evoking. She then had a major psychotic break and spent a year in an in institution healing and began writing personal songs. And that's when her career as a songwriter really Wouldn't that be great different. if we could have like music more in mental hospitals? Well, what, what, what she did was she found ways of dealing with all kinds of, of issues that were huge. Mm -hmm. And music, music and songwriting literally did give her a bridge back. In a subsequent album, years later, she wrote this song called Mythical Kings and Iguanas. And it was all about trying to reconcile her, her mystical states, her states that were connected to her psychotic states, but were not psychotic. They were her walking around functioning in a very sensitive way in the world. And realizing that she could also miss out on, on what was grounded. So, a bit of a lyric from her song. Um, I have flown to star-stained heights on bent and battered wings in search of mythical kings, mythical kings, oh yes. Sure that everything of worth was in the sky and not the earth. And I never learned to make my way down where the iguanas play. Mm, very poetic. Yeah, it really tells a lot just listening to that. I can feel her experience kind of makes me... Uh, and there was there was a, a a line later on. I won't quote a whole another That's stanza, okay. but You're fine. another line was "Cry for the soul who will not face the body as an equal place." Mm. And I never learned to touch for real or feel the things the iguanas feel down where they play. There's something she has about iguanas. There's well, it was it was it was the symbol of it was going from the 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 things in the sky the the, the um, astral walks I've tried to take. I, I sit and throw the I Ching is one of the lines. And then we have iguanas who were in the dirt. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, the meaning. It's almost like I need you to break down the songs, right? <laughs> so she kind of overcame her mental health problem. like, And actually, it sounds like she had a pretty severe one of being psychotic by doing writing and, and playing. She learned, she learned to articulate incredible things and, uh, and came to, came to a, a, very, a, a, a place of self-love. She was a really wise person. I think, though, too, we just sometimes forget about, I mean, just back to neurology, is, you know, we've got the right and left brain, and most of the time we spend our time in the left brain and ignoring the right brain, but really the right brain is always running and always craving that balance, and so that's why I always really encourage my patients to, and I try myself, too, to spend time exposing myself to things that are artistic, like going to museums, you can do sewing, you can listen to music, you can play an instrument, just any kind of exposure because your brain really craves that. And your body, I think, you know, it helps us to release a lot of um, chemicals. Um, in recent study, scientific studies, they found that listening to and playing music can lower levels of cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And I think stress is really at the root of a lot of our issues that we get sick from. Um, the British Journal of Psychiatry actually demonstrated, they wrote a journal uh, article that they said that music therapy when combined with standard care is a, success, is a successful treatment for depression. See, so you intuitively knew that. Absolutely. And I mean, I know depression's run in my family too. So I've had to like really come up with a structure of how I take care of myself. And, and I've gotten really into mindfulness meditation, but I do use music as well. I, I don't think there's a day that goes by I don't listen to music either mm -hmm. in my car. You know, it's such an, an ingrained part of our world. Um, how do you feel? I mean, I know you've talked about your personal experience, and you've also talked about these people in your life that, you, that have been influential to you and how profound it's affected them. I mean, if we were to have, like, a music therapy program in Santa Barbara, I'm mm -hmm. just kind of thinking about that. Um, do you think that would help, you know, if people could go to a place where they could do musical outlet, have a musical outlet, do you think that could help a person through a mental oh, health sure. crisis? Oh, sure. I, th I, think, I think music is an incredible tool. And I, th I think it, it, because some people can play it, some people uh, can simply play an MP3 and listen to it, and they're both valuable. So I think there's different kinds of, I think if you were, were going to, 
press a magic button and create programs. I would want to create programs that that were geared toward people who can access music on in every way, from people who really can literally push a button and listen to it, and that's that's their avenue. That's great because that means your avenue is all the music that's ever been written. And if you if you're able to actually pick up a guitar or play a piano or walk down the street and sing, you've got something else that can be developed as well. And most people can sing. Most people can give themselves joy singing. So, yeah, I think that's a wonderful thing to Wouldn't do. Wouldn't that be cool if we could have like I don't know even Santa Barbara could be like a model city. We could get people. I just feel like I know I have my son's in sixth grade, but I feel like music is such an important piece. I know I did choir and played the piano and clarinet growing up and I didn't play them for very long uh, but I do it's interesting I really solidly remember that as a really positive experience I remember my dad taking me to get the clarinet and and just practicing and even though the sounds that came out weren't perfect it was you know it was just a fun experience so you so try everybody it. can make music that's good enough for their own ears exactly I know but you know it's interesting when I see people in my practice or talk to people about music and I said, well, just go to like a thrift store. You know, they have guitars. It doesn't matter. I bought a guitar that has a missing string. It really doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it's like I had um, Jane Gottlieb on here, who is an amazing artist. And she was saying when she started out, I mean, she's an accomplished artist now. But I mean, it took her 20 years to cultivate that. And you don't have to create a masterpiece. It doesn't. I mean, your music or your art or your expression of yourself does not have to be perfect. I mean, there is no such thing as perfect. So it's yours to make what you want. Mm -hmm. And it's very freeing, I think, and it can really help you have some healing. Um, so we're going to take a break in a minute. I just wanted to just um, let you know we're, we're here talking about mental health and mental health stigma with Peter Melnick. We're going to be talking about prevention and awareness through art. And on our break... I am going to play the song, The Chill, that Peter wrote. Um, it's a deeply personal song. He wrote it two days after the election of 2016 upon hearing the news that Leonard Cohen had died. And then for two days, he had been in a complete haze, um, like everyone else he knew, and struggling to kind of move one foot in front of the other. And with the news about Cohen, it kind of just tipped it into the dam broke. So he wrote this song about loss. Um, ostensibly about Leonard Cohen, but also about the general sense of loss that every sane friend of mine experienced, or his friends experienced after this presidential election. Um, it turns out, though, as Peter thought about it more, he was really writing the song about his father, a song that had been waiting to come out since October 2009 when his dad died. He adored him, and he still misses him every day of his life. It's a, For him, it's a father-son love song. And I think that is such a beautiful, touching piece. I love that you really got deep and you actually kind of morphed into this other understanding. Was, well, it's, you know, I was, I, I really was, like everybody I know, horrified by, by um, the, the national election. And it ain't gotten better, folks. But, um, but I, was, I was feeling the grip of that sense of loss. And then Leonard Cohn died. And, and, and so I was aware of those two things, but I wasn't aware that what was going to come out was my dad. Um, yeah, is that interesting? So it kind of evolved into that. But I mean, maybe your dad was all there all along and maybe it just took some time to come. Oh, yeah. It's just, you know, there, there are some things, I mean, I never wrote a song about 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I think in part because I felt this thing was so horrible and, and I don't, I was afraid of not writing something that, that, that honored it by being good enough. That's a terrible thought. As, as a composer, you can't give yourself room to think that you, ha you have to allow yourself to write junk and let it come out and then you can access the really good stuff. You oppress yourself and shut down when you fear. So, my mistake. I didn't try and write about 9-11. That's okay. I didn't try and write about my father's death because it mattered so much to me. But when I least expected it, but I was full of emotion, it, it came out. And now I've, I've got this love song of grief to my dad. Okay, so I hope you enjoy the chill.
was no air no sound and I stood there frozen inside my shoes oh the facts of life forever changed I'm drifting Welcome back to the Dr. Deborah Show. We just listened to our special guest, Peter Melnick's song, The Chill. Uh, We're live at KCSB FM Santa Barbara 91.9. This is the Dr. Deborah Show, the show where we're talking about bringing peace and calm into your life. I'm a clinical psychologist with a specialty in neuropsychology. I'm also a UCSB alumni, and I live locally in Santa Barbara. And this show is all about our community and how to create compassionate conversations about our well-being and our health. And we're here talking today about mental health and music. And I'm very excited again to announce our special guest, Peter. Peter, again, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. It's been really, fun. It is fun. I'm enjoying having you on the show and I'm learning so much about music. And I hope you are too, um, the people who are listening. Peter has uh, studied with jazz piano legend Jackie Byard. Byard. Okay, I know some of these I have to make sure I, I say yeah. appropriately. And wrote the off-Broadway musical The Last Smoker in America with librettist. Is mm-hmm. that right? Okay, Bill Russell. And he also composed scores to Twyla Tharp's Sextet. The Umbrella Oracle, which is a book by Tony Kushner. And no, Pat- uh, the Umbrella oh. Oracle is, a, is an old Japanese folktale okay. adapted into a musical piece with book, which means script and storyline okay. by Tony Kushner, who at the time was a scrawny kid like me at the time. And he went on to become Tony Kushner, a playwright who wrote Angels in America and is just maybe the greatest living English language playwright. 
I know there's so many little subtleties and I knew I wasn't going to say it right because I know I don't know how the music world works, but I appreciate you explaining that. I know you've done so many cool things. Um, and then Patter for the Floating Lady adapted from Steve Martin's eponymous one act play. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yep. And we've been here talking about mental health stigma and mental health and how it affects sufferers both in terms of their role in society and their route to recovery. And it's not surprising then that the tension has been most recently turned to developing ways in which stigma and discrimination can be reduced. And that's why we're here today talking about this. I'm hoping we can all work together. We're here with Peter, like I've been mentioning, who works in the music and writing worlds, and, and he's here talking about some of the ways mental health impacts our community. We were talking on the break about just ways uh, in our community, how you know we can interface and, and collaborate. And one of the things that Peter was bringing up was his work with Girls Rock, which is a local Santa Barbara organization. I think Jen Barron is the, is she the That's founder? That's right, yep. So he, uh, he wanted to give a little information about that in case you're interested. Well, it, it struck me, it, this is so much up your alley and what you're talking about. Girls Rock Santa Barbara uh, was founded by Jen Barron to provide girls from, I think, the age of 6 to 16. I mean, it starts with amazingly little kids. Yes. To give them, on one level, it's about technical training, get, teaching them how to play an instrument, and when they get old enough to, to, to try and write songs, how, how, to, how to create a song. It's a bunch of technical stuff, but they also have these summer camps. They go in week-long sessions, and what they're really doing is beyond... Music and, and songwriting is the medium, but they're, they're giving... They're empowering girls to... Uh, they're empowering girls, period, so that... A lot of the girls are dealing with issues of sexuality, issues of, of what it is to be a, a, a girl in a patriarchal society. Some 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 of the the girls are are trans girls. Some of them are dealing with various aspects of LGBTQ issues mm -hmm. and and being told uh, that word we started off with earlier in the session today, normal, being yeah. told to, to liberate themselves from from an oppressive idea of what normal is. It's empowerment and all the things you're talking about, allowing girls to express emotion through music and some also photography. So it's an amazing organization, and it's a great example of how... Uh, and also, also, she does a tremendous amount of fundraising, so this is not strictly for people who can afford a fancy week in, o in an Ojai camp. Yeah. Um, they, they reached out this past year to Syrian refugee girls. Wow. Um, and that was a huge thing and a wonderful thing. So... This is a great example of where you can, through music and other arts, give people tools to to understand their lives, to to help heal the world, to help themselves cope. It's a beautiful thing. I love that. So, do, if someone wanted to get involved in that, they could just, I guess, if they Google "Girls Rock okay. SB SB Girls for Santa Barbara Rock SB," right, okay. it will take you to their website and. Uh, it's formidable. It's wonderful. Maybe we'll have them come on and talk about that so we can learn more, too, because I love the idea that there there's opportunity for people to get involved. Jen Barron would be a wonderful <clears throat> guest for you. And I think, you know, that that's a great way for people to access service in a way for their health. And, and they don't maybe have to, you know, pay for, like, health insurance or have a treatment provider. They can just go to Girls Anybody Rock who's and hearing this and, and knows a girl who it might be a, a fit for... They they definitely are set up to, to provide scholarships for people who, who aren't able to pay, and it's 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 a great thing to know about here in town. I love that. Um, so, and I think that yeah, sexual identity is a, a very hot topic. Um, I'm hoping to have somebody come on soon and talk about that in the next coming months. Um, I just think you know it's important for us to accept ourselves, however we want to be, and it's kind of like music; it's a self-expression, and and really, it's nobody else's decision; it's your own personal choice. But I think that negative attitudes are so entrenched. Um, and, and I kind of feel like we need almost campaigns um, <clears throat> to change these beliefs. I actually saw Billy Baldwin. I know he's a local guy in town, and I saw him at a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if you could do a commercial or something and just talk about how we could change our beliefs, um, you know, and, and that, it, you know, we all are here together and we can just kind of impart knowledge about mental health problems that way. Um. I, I just am hoping we can create these conversations in a culture that are more accepting, you know, of each person, and, and then we can work toward this prevention. Um, in the news, to actually, it was just yesterday, the UK, the United Kingdom's health secretary, Matt Hancock, um, announced that doctors should prescribe dance classes, trips to concert halls, and set out plans to make it, he calls, social prescribing. 
Also, I noticed on the news, I was reading something, I think it's in Denmark, where doctors are prescribing nature therapy. So mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of yes. other forms of prescriptions. When I give people mindfulness meditation, I tell them it's a proscription. So just know there's other like medicine in a way out there. It doesn't have to be a pill. It can be music. It can be art. It could be talking to someone. It could be something you eat that you enjoy. There's other ways to take care of ourselves. Um, and so there's not just one approach. But I think the health benefits that can be gained from creative practices are enormous and universal. So we need this widespread investment of people to use creative practices in the arts and humanities to help people stay healthy and recover when illnesses strike. So engaging in creative activities like music making and listening, dance, drawing, comedy, reading groups, visiting museums and galleries, they can kind of be thought of as the shadow side of health service. So just remember that all those pieces, music, making, listening, dance, drawing, any kind of artistic expression can improve our physical and mental health and also increase social connections. Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show. Do you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners? I just want to add some, build on what you said a minute ago, because we live in this incredibly beautiful place. And I was thinking about, you know, my grandfather's, one of his last great songs was The Sound of Music. Yes. That begins, and the movie of it was one of the great film musicals, beginning with Maria, Julie Andrews, in these beautiful hills, singing, I go to the hills and my heart is lonely. I know I will hear what I've heard before. My heart will be blessed with the sound of music and I will sing once more. Go to the beach. It's free. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful. And even if you don't know how to make a, a note of music, that sound will, I, will heal you. I agree completely. I sometimes lay under trees. And I look at the light coming through the leaves and I listen to the leaves and I feel like the tree's making music for me. And if you just stand by the beach, it's true, or anywhere, you can hear lots of beautiful sounds, but you just have to, you know, use your other senses. It's about making time for your soul. It is. I think we, even if it's 10 seconds, you know, I mean, I think we just need to find little moments. So if we each do our part toward ending negative perceptions about mental health and raise awareness, we can live in a more loving, safe, and accepting world. I want to thank my special guest, Peter Melnick, for coming in today and sharing his wisdom. If you have any questions, please feel free to write me on my Facebook page, Dr. Deborah Show. I also want to give a quick shout out to HopeNet of Carpentry. I'm on the board of HopeNet of Carpentry. They serve our community to work toward prevention and awareness. If you or someone you know needs help, call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or the Santa Barbara Access Line at 1-888-868-1649.